I was asked out in the corridor what I like to be called, and I said, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, once he left the presidency, was down in Brazil, and Brazil's host was a four-star general equivalent in the Brazilian Armed Forces, and he asked Teddy what he wanted to be called, and Teddy said, Colonel, it's the only rank I ever earned. That's the way I feel. And I do have an affection for my profession, and my profession was the profession of arms. As I tell my students, I was a professional in killing people for the state. And that's what your presidents, and I don't care whether they're Democrats or Republicans, Obama or Bush, have been doing now for a very long time in your name is killing people for state purposes, risking the lives of American citizens for those same state purposes, and now in the most unbalanced, incredibly inequitable way in our history. And that is saying something because we have never sent anyone to die for the state in our history except poor people. World War II, as two, two very good sociologists at the University of Minnesota have just shown in a, a very exquisite scholarly paper citing data all the way from the Spanish-American War forward, World War II is the only war that we have ever fought with 12 million of our citizens plus under arms where there was rough equity in those who served, and even that rough equity was considerably unbalanced. Henry Kissinger, for example, was in intel, far from the trenches, far from the bullets. And so it is with all wealthy people in every war we've ever fought, but let me tell you that today, the differences, as these scholars have corroborated, is so staggering as I would think it would make even a Texan feel bad. <laughs> we have the fourth and fifth quintiles in affluence, in education, in almost any measure of success in society, bleeding and dying for the rest of us. We have a bribed force. Not an all-volunteer force, a bribed force. Your army spent half a billion dollars yes, uh, last year on such bribes to just the infantrymen and still fell 6,000 short of its recruiting goal. As a consequence of that, it took 1,400 people who can't even read their name on a guard roster, and it took 7,000 people who had to have major crimes or drug use or both waived. Your army has 40% of its enlisted ranks coming from seven states. And you can name those states. And they're all well below the Mason-Dixon line, unless you look at the interior of Maine and the exterior, as it were, of Oklahoma. Now, they don't lead in terms of numbers, but per capita, they're right in there with the top 10. That is what we have allowed to happen to an instrument of national security which is supposed to be defensive, supposed to secure us from those threats in the world, minuscule though they are these days, that might really want to do some damage to us. And you have let, and I'm right there with you, we have let the defense budget go to such proportions that even the Congressional Budget Office in a recent analysis says that by just 2030, at the present rate of increase of the defense budget, roughly 2 to 3% annually, and the present rate of increase with projected interest and inflation increases of the annual payment on the national debt, now almost $22 trillion, T, not a B, T, we will have no federal discretionary spending by 2030. 
And I'm in the Senate Finance Committee's professional staff members, arguably the only really caring individuals in the Congress, two weeks ago, telling them this. And they're looking at me from both sides of the aisle, if you will. This is professional staff. They'll work for anybody. They're telling me they don't know what to do about it. That no one is seized of the gravity of this situation. Well, I can tell you this. The American people are going to be seized of it, but it's going to be too late. Because we are going to either default on our payments, annual payments. You, you can keep the debt going up. Okay, fine. It doesn't matter, said Dick Cheney. Ronald Reagan proved deficits don't matter. Okay, if you buy that theory, you can keep that debt going as far as you want it to go. But you've got to pay those annual payments. Otherwise, you default and just try that and see what happens to our economy. That's what we've done to ourselves. And we have let it happen. I've been in all 50 states in the last 10 years. And the one thing that strikes me more than anything else is the ignorance. And I don't use that in a pejorative sense. I would simply mean it as an English word meaning lacking knowledge and the apathy, and I do mean that in a pejorative sense. It's out of my kin, it's out of my element. I don't know what to do, I can't do anything. It's just not my issue, it's Washington. I particularly hear that out in places like Washington, Idaho, <laughs> and that state that generates more of our GDP than 14 or 15 other states combined and has 40 million people and sits beside a state with 400,000, both of whom have two senators in the Congress, in the sense of one of these days we're gonna spin off. And of course I'm talking about California. And well, they could spin off, depending on whose data you're looking at. They're the fifth, sixth, or seventh largest economy in the world. And without California and New York, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana would disappear. They'd be Botswanas. They couldn't survive. The only way they survive is revenue sharing. The money that comes from California and New York and other prosperous, more prosperous states. That's what we've got in this country now in a political sense, and that's one reason why you have people trying to change that, but not necessarily for the better. They're trying to change it for the plutocracy. It's not an oligarchy. Look up your terms from Aristotle and Plato's days. An oligarchy is a small group of people that run your country. A plutocracy is a small group of people that run your country and they are in power because they're billionaires. That's what we have in this country now, more so than we've ever had before. And as a somewhat historian of the pre-World War II days and a historian of the post-World War II days, I can tell you it's not ever been too different, but that it is so glaringly different today that we confront two possible scenarios. Either we're going to dismember ourselves, that is to say we're going to start falling apart, or a consortium of powers in the world are gonna balance us and in the end to our detriment. Check out human history for the last 5,000 years, monarchy, princedom, democracy, whatever type of state you're talking about. When one of them becomes a hegemon and that hegemon becomes oppressive, the rest of the world moves to balance it. Charles de Gaulle once said the most pernicious weapon that America wielded was the power of the dollar. China and Russia today, in certain respects, in concert, in others individually, are doing everything they can to sneak up on the dollar and to ultimately replace it. And maybe not Moscow, but Beijing certainly has the patience of Job. They will keep doing it until they do it. And on that day, the external reckoning for this country will come. 
Well, how did we get here? How did we get from a point of imperfection at best, but nonetheless progress? We did discard that founding sin called slavery, though I will tell you right now in Washington, D.C., racism is as rampant as possibly it ever was. D.C.'s public schools are so segregated that you would search forever to find a white person. But we have made progress over the years. How did we get to the point then, around 1972, 1973, where things began to go off the rails? We fell from grace, as it were. Most of the problem that I study and that I teach and that I see is associated with the state building effort that began in 1947 with Harry Truman's signing of that act called the 1947 National Security Act, July of that year. General George Marshall, Marshall uh, you may know, may remember some of the older ones of you, <laughs> was probably the iconic military professional figure along with Dwight Eisenhower of that period. Marshall is said to have looked at the president, and I can certainly see George Marshall doing this because he was mu as much citizen as he was soldier, as was Eisenhower, and said, Mr. President, I fear we have militarized the decision-making process. What prescience? By 1972, it was becoming clearly apparent to scholars, limited though they were at that time, of the national security state, that we were indeed headed towards becoming a full-fledged, full-blown, full-up national security state. And what does that mean? It means that your raison d'etre is making war. It means that the complex you have built up as a result of your becoming the new Rome in 1945, waging war in two theaters simultaneously, you have become the worst possible thing that you could become given that experience. You've become a warfare state, a national security state in scholarly parlance. Your whole purpose is to sustain that national security state. Toss into that an electoral process that hasn't been really updated in 200 plus years and that is anything but democracy except by remove. We've never had a pure democracy, even though we've changed things like states don't pick our senators anymore, we elect them. We still have the vestiges of that early time, like the Electoral College, which gives Wyoming and 400,000 people two senators, and California and 40 million people two senators. Thank you very much. If I were a businessman, I would look at Wyoming and I would say, get thee into California. This is inefficient, ineffective. This is stupid. But I'm not a businessman, so I can't say that. Besides, Wyoming's residents would really, really be angry if I said that. And California's residents would be even more angry. <laughs> they don't want those Wyoming dudes in their state. Believe me, I fly fish out there all the time and I hear these arguments all the time. So what do you do if your state building effort has come to fruition roughly around the first term of Ronald Reagan and you actually have the contamination that occurs in that first term becoming de rigueur? That is to say, it's what we do. In order to support Ronald Reagan's massive arms buildup in his first term, the CIA actually cooked up a story about the Soviet Union. In the bowels of the CIA, people who knew the Soviet Union were saying, it's coming apart. It's going to collapse. George Kennan was right. Just the weight of their ideology and the impossibility of it supporting a robust economy is going to destroy them. And it is about to happen. Well, what did Ronald Reagan do? He hired Bill Casey. Did he do this wittingly? I don't know. But he hired Bill Casey to be the director of the CIA. And Bill Casey said, what do you need, Mr. President? And he said, I need a robust, powerful, threatening Soviet Union. And he got it. 
and he got the largest buildup in arms since World War II and the Korean War. That was falsified intelligence for political purposes. Where have you heard that recently? And that's what national security states do. They take the arm of government, if you will, created in 1947, the CIA. We never had a CIA before that time. We never had a military industrial complex before that time. We built that for World War II. And George Washington put it eloquently when he said, if we go to war, we will get our implements of war from our citizens. You make cannons, you make airplanes, whatever. Well, World War II, we changed that philosophy and we built a military industrial complex and it did not go away after the war. So all of that came together in that first Reagan term and it came together for some nefarious purposes, but the most prominent of those purposes that took resource after resource after resource from what I call the welfare state, and I don't use that term pejoratively, I'm not talking about a communist state, I'm talking about a state whose principal purpose is taking care of its people. That's what I'm talking about when I say a welfare state. Looked at the welfare state and said, whoa, that's competing with the national security state. We need to stop that. And that became the mantra of my political party. Not all of them, to be sure. It never was Colin Powell's purpose. Colin Powell used to say, I'm really a Republican for security policy and a Democrat for social policy. Got him into trouble a lot in the Republican party. <laughs> But that's what we did in that first Reagan term. We started a warfare on the welfare state. And it was to build up and make more permanent and more resource intensive the national security state. And anyone who thinks the Democrats dissented from that is smoking some cheap stuff. Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton, William Jefferson Clinton, Bob Rubin, Larry Summers, you name the Democrat. They went along with it in spades. They just gave it a little bit different rhetoric so they could maintain the progressive wing of their party. And so what you have today in Congress that I have been dealing with on the Yemen war for the past 12 months is a leadership that I cannot tell you the difference between on any critical issue of national security. And one of the most welcome things that I have seen happen, I'm 75 now, one of the most welcome things I've seen happen in the Congress is these young people coming in, and I hope to heck that they mean what they say. And I hope there's a whole lot more of them. That said, I will, I will tell you this. My wife and I campaigned for Tim Kaine in Virginia and Jim Webb in Virginia. Jim, a Republican turned Democrat, and Tim, a lifelong Democrat. And we were in a parking lot of a middle school one day. We were walking out to our car after uh, a campaign rally for Jim Webb, Tim Kaine, Mark Warner. And my wife turned to me and said, uh, herself a lifelong Republican and having gone to me, with me to all kinds of black tie and other affairs with Republicans, she turned to me and she said, you know these Democrats are all right. They're a different breed of cat. You can talk to them. They actually talk about things like poetry and Shakespeare and love and you know, peace and all like, these are, these are all right people. So I do find, even as I put the leadership in the same boat, a distinct difference between those rallying to the Democratic flag and those rallying to my flag, which is largely a flag with dollar signs on it. That said, and back to the original point, the leadership of the national security state is pretty much undivided. It doesn't matter whether you're talking to Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell, war is on their agenda. Support of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and Boeing and a host of others is on their agenda. Taking money from these people for their PACs and so forth is on their agenda. Calling these people and getting them to do what they need to be done is on the military industrial complex's agenda. It's not like, as one of my friends said in the Air Force, that someone ran, for example, to Dick Cheney and said, get me a war for Halliburton. You know, and Cheney reached out and got a war for Halliburton. By the way, Halliburton made $40 billion of clear profit off Afghanistan and Iraq. 
That beat ExxonMobil a couple of years. Another story there. But this is what we have become, this national security state. And we don't have people differentiating themselves or moving away from this state in their decision making or their thinking, except in the young people. And one hopes and prays, and I'm amongst that congregation, that they're not contaminated by this state before they get to the point where they can make a difference. But I will tell you frankly, my 15 years in civilian academics now, first at the George Washington University and William and Mary, and now exclusively at William and Mary, but traveling all over the country to speak on different college campuses, they're the only thing about this country that gives me hope in the future because they are a different breed of cat, and they do want to make a difference, and they don't want the world that you and I and others like us have built. It's stunning in some respects. Their ideas jibe more with the kinds of things that we should have been doing 20 years ago, like addressing energy, addressing where and when we do certain things with our agriculture. All the things that need to change if we are indeed as a race, as well as a nation, going to survive in the next hundred years. I belong to a group in Washington led by DOD, and here's another thing, you know, national security state, who's leading the federal bureaucracy in its response to climate change? DOD. Why? Because the military is the only entity in Washington that thinks strategically. And the military sees it coming. Whether it's having to lift up cables in Norfolk at a cost of $25 million that were never, never contemplated to be underwater and now are underwater so that the carriers can communicate with one another when they're in for maintenance, or whether it's going to Charleston and finding out that you're gonna have significant problems in the next 10 years or it's being on Fort Bragg, North Carolina during a heavy rainstorm and not being able to deploy for five days the nation's strategic reserve because the water's too deep in the streets. The military gets it. But do you want the military leading our response to climate change? By default, they are. In so many other areas, by default, the military is now functioning. Diplomacy is now carried out more forcefully, more powerfully, and more consistently by four-star generals and admirals than it is by anyone from the State Department. I have been there. I have been in the Prime Minister's offices in Tokyo and heard him say to an Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific, where's the admiral? It's a very meaningful question. The admiral in Honolulu comes to the prime minister in Tokyo with carrier battle groups, atomic weapons, marine amphibious groups, army divisions. The secretary of state comes with a briefcase, often empty. Our allies know who speaks for us, and it ain't the diplomats. It's the four stars and the three stars. We have just solidified the command of the world by the armed forces. You probably know, most Americans don't, we created a unified command. We have the whole world divided up now into fiefdoms for the military in Africa. My entire 31 career, year career in the military, I was one of the staunchest voices, but I didn't have much trouble because everyone else felt the same way that we did not want to ruin Africa with the military having command over it. Well, we done that. And Barack Obama signed the Unified Command Plan change. Turn Africa over to the military. Africa is as, about a, as amenable to change, positive change, directed by the US military as my grandkids are to get rid of their smartphones. Ain't gonna happen. We are contaminating the last continent on earth that was not contaminated by, a military, by our military now. This is insanity. And I go to California, I go to Wyoming, I go to Montana, Texas, Iowa, it doesn't matter. And Americans look at me with glazed eyes. What is he talking about? Unified command plan. 
that the President of the United States signs, and that divides the world up into fiefdoms, each one run by a four-star military officer. And then they look at me even with more concern when I say, do you know we have 809 military bases in the world, and that the rest of the world, including Russia and China, have only 77 bases? The rest of the world, and we have over 800. And do you know that those 800 bases cost you as a taxpayer $75 billion plus every year? And do you know that those bases themselves incite wars? When you put the military in a place like Bahrain and let it see the Saudis have to roll across the causeway to protect that dictator in Bahrain from his own people, you understand very, very quickly why that military is there. And you understand why that military, even in and of itself, incites conflict where it is. You also understand things such as Michiglini points out in his book, McMafia, that the reason the greatest money laundering by the criminal syndicates in the world is located in Doha is because they're surrounded by the U.S. military and feel safe. And then when you hear that canard coming from people like Hillary Clinton and like Nancy Pelosi and others saying, oh, you're pulling out of Syria, you're pulling out of Syria, you want to just slap their faces. 2,000 Marines out of Syria, we're pulling out of the Middle East. Do you know what we have in the Middle East? The largest naval base in our entire panoply in Bahrain, the 5th Fleet Headquarters. The largest Air Force installation on Earth in Qatar. The second largest one in Saudi Arabia and 11 others, in case that one doesn't work. Exercises with Egypt, exercises with Oman, the largest logistic and reception facility for the United States Army in the world in Kuwait. And I could go on and on, and we're pulling out of the Middle East. Give me a break, people. When was the last time you studied anything? We are all over the Middle East. And so why do we have people who hate our guts and want to kill us? Because we're all over their land. How could you be any different? Why do we have Putin in Ukraine and Putin in Georgia and Putin in Crimea? Because Bill Clinton decided Poland needed F-16s to keep Lockheed Martin viable and making massive, obscene profits, and so agreed to sell F-16s to Poland. If I were Putin, I'd have done the same thing. I served H.W. Bush and Colin Powell as chairman of the Joint Chiefs when we told the Russians, you can be partners with us. You can be members of NATO eventually. We'll make you observers right off the bat. And we did. And when we finished up that time period, Jim Baker, our Secretary of State, had told Edward Shevardnadze, the foreign minister of the then quickly disappearing Soviet Union, that we would not move NATO one inch further east if they agreed to the reunification of Germany, a monumental accomplishment and its retention in NATO, we would not go an inch further east. And what did Bill Clinton do? He took us to Georgia. Look at the map, that's a little further than an inch. And into Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and a host of other places. Had I been Vladimir Putin, I would have done exactly what Vladimir Putin has done with very limited power and a nation with less population than Pakistan, and a nation whose longevity is decreasing every day, a basket case of a nation, Putin has played a pretty good game. He's beaten us because of our own strategic incompetence, a strategic incompetence brought about by our fixation on the warfare state, our fixation on things like Afghanistan and Iraq and other places where we should not even have gone, shouldn't be now, and probably shouldn't be at any point in the conceivable future, except with diplomats and businessmen and women and economists and educators and others who can help these people tackle the challenges of modernity. Not the least of which is the only existential crisis that I can see on the horizon call the climate crisis. I was recently giving a talk in Richmond in the theater Richmond, Virginia. 
And I was talking about the problems, as I just briefly mentioned here, that the Navy has in Norfolk. And this woman in the back of the theater, she was about 45 or 50, she leapt to her feet and she said, don't talk to me about the problems the Navy's having. I got water in my damn backyard right now. She's right. Norfolk, Yorktown, Chesapeake, that area, they get it. They, they get it about sea rise. I'm not sure that they get all the other aspects of it, but they'll get it soon. But they certainly get it about sea rise. And as I said, the military and all its coastal installations gets it too. But what are we doing? Check out the heads of agencies that ought to be doing really work that's 20 years in the past due now, and they're not really doing very much. Part of it's this presidency, to be sure, but part of it's just the general lassitude of the federal government with regard to having an imagination. Those of you who are familiar with George Bernard Shaw may recall that line from Joan of Arc. I can't recall the exact quotation, but it goes something like this. Must a Christ be tortured in every generation to save those with no imagination? What a pertinent line. We have no imagination. We have no creativity. Certainly not in Washington. Where I do find it is in the States, to a certain extent, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the states are moving a lot faster than Washington. And in some cases, I've met with governors who've essentially told me Washington's brain dead. We're moving out on our own. But there you come back to this complex again. The complex is so ubiquitous. It is so everywhere. It is so powerful. It is so wealthy that if it sees something, even in this meeting of an existential threat that's way out there in the future maybe, they see an enemy, an enemy to their treasure, an enemy to their way of life, whether it's nuclear weapons or it's aircraft carriers or whatever, they see that as a threat, a threat to the resources or a threat to the actual instrument or the lifestyle it breeds. And so they're again it. And there you have one of the most powerful elements in the country, politically and otherwise, impeding progress. It's come down to a battle between you and the welfare state. Remember what I said now, that's taking care of yourself and your own people, everything from Alzheimer's to better medical care and a better, better medical care system to our security. Our security being if the enemy's on the beach, we'll rally and we'll go beat him. But if he ain't on the beach, what are you talking to me for? And this idea that terrorists are an existential threat to this country, we kill more people with guns and automobiles every month than have been killed in every terrorist attack that's killed an American in the last hundred years. So don't tell me that's an existential threat. Turn it back over to law enforcement where it should be. These people are criminals, they're not warriors. And when you elevate them to warrior status, you give them a credibility and a robustness they shouldn't have ask the Indians and the Pakistanis who are now caught up in their own mess of having created so many terrorist groups that they can't even escape them now and they might be involved in a nuclear exchange because of that. I'll finish on that point because it is so illustrative of what happens when you have national security states and one of them happens to be the most powerful country in the world. The situation in Kashmir is not nearly as simplistic or simple as it looks. You actually have Mohammed bin Salman, that wonderful young man from Saudi Arabia who might be the most brutal son of a bitch on the face of the earth right now, going to Islamabad and offering them some $20 billion, not least of which the reason for was thank you very much for doing what you're doing with your terrorist groups who are now attacking Iran and killing people in Iran. Hmm, how did Saudi Arabia get involved in Kashmir? I just told you. And India looking at the whole thing and saying, whoa, Donald Trump started a trade war with me yesterday, bet most of you missed that, and I'm doing all these things with Iran, so Saudi Arabia might be just trying to do something through Pakistan 
to destabilize me so I'll get the message and quit doing things with Iran. This is not just about Kashmir, in other words. Few of these national security issues are so simplistic as being about Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or whatever. They're much more complicated, they're much more serious, and they are not fixable, by and large, with military power. They're fixable by diplomacy, astute, careful, exquisite diplomacy. The kind of diplomacy we did in the beginning when we were ranged against three formidable empires, Spain, France, and Britain, from whom we sprung, of course. At that time, we had people like John Quincy Adams who went to the court in Russia, for example, and was rumored to know more about Napoleon's movements than any other person in the world and communicated them back to Washington, which wound up in one of the greatest acquisitions this country ever made, the Louisiana Purchase. That's what diplomacy can do for you. But we were small, tiny, and feared conquering by one or both or two or three of the empires in the world at the time. Now we are the empire. We don't fear anybody. We don't need diplomats. We will fix everything with military power. You disobey our writ and we will bomb you. We will send our F-16s and F-35s and F-22s and bomb you to smithereens. Don't anybody fool with us. Don't anybody mess with us. Don't remind you of anybody like maybe Dick Cheney. That's our philosophy. War is the answer to every problem. War is extremely profitable. War is the raison d'etre of the empire. And we let it happen. Thank you. Good question? Sure. Okay, uh, I, I think I detected about three questions in there. Um, the, the, the first question, very important question, is why did, it not, why did I not address, that was the implication, nuclear weapons as an existential threat? They certainly are, and I think they're a worse threat today than they were in 1962, October, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Kashmir is demonstrating that aspect of it today. But it's also more difficult today because of what we've done. We have essentially stated to the world in no uncertain terms, if you talk to Berlin or Tokyo or Paris or Brussels, that it's all over in terms of nuclear arms control. Now, if you think about that for a moment, that's not just withdrawing from the INF Treaty. That's not just violating, and that's what we did. Don't anybody mistake that. I had to study this for four years as a State Department policy planner and then chief of staff, we violated the JCPOA, JCPOA because we are signatory to the treaty that founded the UN, and that treaty says decisions made by the UN Security Council are binding on all the members. It doesn't matter what president got that resolution passed, they're binding. So we violated the JCPOA. Those sorts of things, withdrawal from the INF, the JCP, JCPOA, my administration's abrogation of the ABM Treaty, without any effort, bilateral or multilateral, and today it ought to be multilateral, to put arms control procedures that are even more firm, agreed to, and universally accepted into effect was a tragic mistake. We have started a new arms race in nuclear weaponry. Putin picked up on it immediately, and has changed his doctrine now to where his armies, when they exercise, culminate the exercise, and the scenario is a penetration by a NATO force somewhere in there near abroad. Their doctrine now calls for blunting that penetration with a small yield nuclear weapon or two or three. It's their doctrine. It's what they practice. So we have opened Pandora's box again with regard to nuclear weapons, and you're right. It is existential. If you've listened to Daniel Ellsberg or read some of the things he's written recently, Daniel will tell you all about nuclear winter and the other aspects of nuclear warfare that are prohibitive to even starting 
And we actually have people talking, like the Pakistanis and the Indians and certain generals in the US military, about small yield nuclear weapons below a half a KT, essentially being nothing more than a bigger pop on the battlefield. It's very dangerous, it's extremely dangerous. So your point is well taken. And I, I didn't mean to leave it out. Uh, the other two questions you had, okay. I've not had a chance to study all the detail. I'm not sure all the details available yet, at least not in a political sense in Washington. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard some of the argument from my side, the Republicans, uh, who were using it politically, and that was what I was gonna tell you in response to one of your other questions, is most of this is domestic politics. It, it, it has little to do with the reality of the world or the realities of power or security. It's mostly domestic politics, and one of the things this president has done is made that absolutely the case. It's his, uh, the German foreign minister put it best when he withdrew or violated the JCPA. The German foreign minister in English said, I know why he did it, he did it to please his base. It had nothing to do with international security, with the relations with Europe or anything else. Um, so that's my problem right now is detail because I've been the Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, PSYOX, other people that I've been associated with have been very good at putting detail to what they're talking about, whether it's wind and solar, whether it's uh, some sort of intermediary type of energy structure before we go completely to a new technology altogether, many of which, and I'm astounded at how many of them are out there now, are being developed because it is becoming clear to the entrepreneurship of this country that there's money to be made in doing something very, very differently. And maybe the more dramatic difference might be the most money. So the market's beginning to drive a lot of this. So until the details put with it, like for example, the Citizens Climate Lobby has the carbon, uh, revenue neutral carbon plan. I, it's hard to comment on. It's hard to say, you can comment generally and say, yes, I'm in favor of that kind of movement because we've got to have something like that. We've got to move away from fossil fuels, period. Um, I don't see the detail yet, so it's, it's hard to comment on something you don't see the detail on. Sure. I was driving across West Virginia recently, the highway to nowhere, they call it, because the great senator from West Virginia got this highway built, and he got it built. Here, here's the serendipity or the weirdness of fate sometimes. He got it built essentially not for you and me, tourists for his own citizens. He got it built so the coal trucks could make it in and out of the coal country on a more profitable basis and faster and so forth, to the railheads and so forth. Well, guess what you see now when you, I was stunned, when you drive across that road to nowhere, wind turbines everywhere, <laughs> all over West Virginia and some of them abutting the coal fields and the mountains that they rip the tops off of and so forth. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, my God, the senator from West Virginia did something good after all. Because <laughs> now, of course, they're maintained and kept up and everything with that road being the principal logistics route. <laughs> Hi there, I'm interested in uh, your opinion about what's happening to Ilhan Omar right now, where she's getting a lot of uh, attacks for criticizing the influence of the Israeli lobby in the United States. I was wondering if, um, one, if you could just establish if you think that Israel commits crimes against the Palestinian people, and then two, if you think that they have an outsized uh, influence over the U.S., and if so, why? The foreign agent of consequence operating in the United States today to the detriment of the United States security is Israel, period. You know, pe people want to say it's Russia, China, APAC, uh, APAC of course for Israel, FDDD, FDD, Foundation for Defense of Democracies for Israel, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, they have a point, ARP, you know, NRA, they have a point, but no one is as effective and as detrimental to our interests as Israel. And it's partly because of the one million plus Russian immigrants that flowed into Israel and now have been captured by people like Avigdor Lieberman, their defense minister, potential future prime minister, 
who basically talked Netanyahu into combining the worst elements in Israel into a single party. And now that's what we have. We have an extremely right-wing government in Israel that believes it covets not only the West Bank, Gaza, and other places, but might even be coveting Jordan and other sources of water, which is rapidly becoming a real problem for the whole region. Do you know that India, in about 60% of its arable land, only has about two years of water left? Been reading up on that? Water. You want to see some resource wars in the future? We're going to be fighting over water. Not enough of it. Is that... This democracy, such as it is, operates very slowly. And even for a person as old as I am, too slowly. And yet, I have to take some encouragement from what I have seen in the last year and witnessed with FCNL and others who are very, very opposed. I mean, FCNL is opposed to war, period. When I say, well, you, you need a military to protect you in case, they go, poo. <laughs> so we have really made FCNL, not, not, not me so much, but FCNL and others, AFSC, uh, Win Without War, a whole bunch of NGOs in Washington, a difference in the last year with regard to Yemen. And if you'll watch it very carefully now, I was just looking at the paper this morning and looking at my phone, it's snowballing. It's snowballing with regard to Syria, with regard to Afghanistan, with regard to Iraq, with regard to Iran. We are finally waking up the Congress to its constitutional war power. Harry Truman set us on the current precedent by going to Korea against even Dean Acheson's advice and never going to Congress. It took him two weeks before his Secretary of State convinced him that he maybe ought to talk to the body from whence he had come. He had already started the troops rolling. Ever since then, in various forms, we have been going to war without congressional approval. We have now stirred up some people in the Senate and the House for different political reasons, back to your question earlier, for different domestic political reasons in many cases, even Republicans who are saying, you know, this shouldn't be the president's will. He shouldn't be doing this. I don't know if you saw Reese from Idaho in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee answering a question and then standing up and pontificating. Reese, the senator from Idaho, actually said in front of Bob Corker's committee, the president ought to have the right to fire nuclear weapons anytime he feels like it after only consulting with the experts around him. You comfortable with that? This is where we've come with some of these idiots. They don't even read the Constitution. They have no idea why the founders said the war power in the hands of the executive is the surest route to tyranny, James Madison. But we're reawakening that thought. And I'm encouraged by the fact that they are beginning to take action and to propose legislation in ways they weren't doing a year, two years ago. And I'd like to attribute that to your activities too and others like you all across the country. That's a good question. I think my experience in 1991 and 92 with Colin Powell as H.W. Bush told us to cut the military by 25% and ultimately we cut it by 28% and taking down the defense industrial base is what we call the military industrial complex by a commensurate portion um, leads me to say it ain't half as bad as we think it might be. In fact, you would not believe probably the letters and cards that we have gotten in the decades since from mayors and governors telling us that closing down their military installation or shutting down their nuclear facility or whatever was the best thing we ever did. And there's a reason, there's an economic reason for that. And the economic reason is pointed out in a number of papers that people never read, they gather dusk on shelves, that say that a military dollar is not a multiplier dollar. It's a dollar that comes into Fort Benning, Georgia and dies at Fort Benning, Georgia, basically. Maybe it's shared with some people from outside the base who work on the base, but that's increasingly less so too, 
because now they're becoming, and this is a problem with the civil military divide, you've heard about that, reservations, federal reservations are becoming a thing unto themselves. And they don't take in, for example, in DOD schools, children from the outside community, which was also always a policy to make the relations better. They don't anymore for physical reasons, but they don't. They just take in the people on the reservations, children. So we're, we're, we're getting wider and wider. An education dollar multiplies four to five times. An economic dollar multiplies anywhere from three to seven times. An entrepreneurial dollar multiplies anywhere from three to 10 times. I mean, there are all kinds of economic factors there. So the basic answer is find yourself some other employment. It's there. And if you do the green deal or something approximating it, I think you've got the future for jobs and the jobs are gonna be plentiful. If you really wanna be scared about jobs, read some of the fundamentally engineering analyses out of places like Harvard, MIT, that tell us that artificial intelligence, robotics, and a few other more esoteric technologies are gonna eliminate anywhere from 20 to 30 million jobs over the next decade or so. You will get your hamburger from a robot. You will have your roof done by a robot and so forth. That's more scary to me than eliminating military jobs. The, the, the fact that we're going to move into an age where I hope jobs commensurate at the pay level and so forth are created but AI and robotics and other technologies are gonna change our lives majorly. Look at your smartphone. Look at your grandchildren. Addicted, just as sure as if it were cocaine. I mean, unless you're really special like one of my daughters, or my only daughter, <laughs> uh, you're not using that phone. You're not watching that. My two grandkids on my daughter's side come to my house to watch television every now and then. My, my daughter will not allow them to watch television. They're homeschooled. They're completely ahead of everybody else I know at that age level. Um, maybe that's the future, I don't know, but it's gonna be disruptive with this new technology coming down the pipe. AI scares me to death. It really does. You, you're seeing it now when you pick up the telephone and you call and, and so forth. But I've seen some applications that are just gonna, I don't know, I, I can see a future where people are completely mesmerized by the holograph they can put in their home. And they gamble, they have sex, they do whatever they wanna do with that holograph in their living room, and they're completely addicted to it, like now some are addicted to cocaine, heroin, and so forth. And the powers that be that create that technology want it that way. And they want to be able to surveil you the entire time you're doing it and sell you more crap. That's where, that's where the nasty side of this new technology is headed. I'm monitored right now on my computer by the NSA, the FBI. The FBI has searched my home I'm pretty confident the FBI has my phone system bugged. You, it's not like the TV. You would never know this was there unless you had a very sophisticated, very expensive surveillance team come into your home and, and do what they do. And even then, the chances on detection are probably 50-50. You cover up the mirror, the camera on your laptop? I do. I can tell you right now, I've been there. I've seen it. They can surveil you from the NSA 24 hours a day. If they want to get you, they can get you better than that. If you communicate with your computer by email overseas, and I do every day, and you have someone from overseas communicate with you, you are in the database. You are being surveilled. Right now, it's an algorithm. You say something that triggers that algorithm to go into human surveillance, just like that. They'll be surveilling you 24 seven and they'll be watching everything you do. That is right now, today. 
There is no privacy left. Your best defense, one NSA operative said to me, a former student of mine, she said, your best defense is anonymity. Well, you're not anonymous if you're emailing overseas or being emailed to from overseas. One of the reasons I was watching Trump very closely was because during his campaign, he made statements that made me believe he was against the war, or a stupid war, at least. Um, and I followed him fairly closely in that regard. First thing I determined was Donald Trump said one thing on Monday, another thing on Wednesday, and another thing on Friday. And so I couldn't put a whole lot of faith in what he was saying. When he became president, one of the first things he did and I'll bet you there isn't anybody in this room that knows this. Maybe if you do, raise your hand. I'd like to talk to you afterwards. He shut down Operation Timber Sycamore. Okay, got one back there. That was the covert operation that we joined Saudi Arabia with to try and overthrow Bashar al-Assad. You know, that got started was 200,000 Syrian farmers didn't have water for their second year in a row and got angry. And it was basically a farmer's protest against Damascus. And we in the Saudis saw an opportunity to overthrow Assad, and we started a covert operation. And if you want to see incompetence, if you want to see your tax dollars being wasted, take a glance at the CIA. Completely out of control. Presidents don't even control them anymore. I've been there. I've seen it. When we tried to overthrow Hugo Chavez in 2002 and mounted a covert operation outside Caracas, it was about a week later that President Bush was briefed on it. You think CIA shuts down from president to president? Uh-uh. They just keep on going. Well, Trump found out about Timber Sycamore and shut it down. Did it stop? No. But at least he had good intentions. So all that to say, I don't know about Donald Trump. I don't know what his uh, actions are going to be from Monday to Tuesday. But so far, the security state has beat him. So far, the security state is still getting what it wants. And if you want the most significant thing he did, and this is counterintuitive, mind, mind you, he fired Jim Mattis. Jim Mattis, I've known for a long time, Jim Mattis was a creature of the empire. One of the smarter creatures of the empire, but a creature of the empire. All Jim Mattis knew how to do as Secretary of Defense was ask for more money in the slush fund, the OCO account, and in the mainline budget. That's all he knew how to do. Didn't do a thing imaginative or creative for defense, he just wanted more money. Donald Trump fired him. And people think they fired him over Syria, fired him over that, fired him over that. He fired him because he was the most important, powerful member of the bureaucracy, the national security state bureaucracy, opposing Donald Trump. So when he fired him, he made himself look powerful, especially to his base, and he got rid of the person most apt to oppose him in the cabinet. And he got rid of him and replaced him, if you can say he replaced him, with a proponent of the national security empire, a man who spent his life at Boeing, and who is not going to contest a single thing Donald Trump says because he's a pure, pure creature of the complex. So where do we go from here? That's my question. There is no one in your government today who has your interest at heart, I guarantee you.